I'm talking about telling stories with data and um, how I do that in my, in my role. So why data storytelling? The interesting thing about data for me is people always think about it as a kind of cold, you know, abstract thing that's not really about emotions or humanity. And I, I actually think that data is a very kind of human process. And it's something that I think about a lot in terms of my journey, how I got into data. Um, this is me when I was, uh, when I was seven. And um, I, I definitely didn't like maths. I liked kind of taking things apart. I liked understanding how the world worked. I didn't understand you know, how maths would be relevant to me in my life at all, which is ironic for what I do now. I did like Richard Scarry. Does anybody grow up with Richard Scarry? I know it's, yeah. So I love Richard Scarry stories, partly because being a reporter looks really cool. You've got a big carrot pen. Um, but also because he did a lot of these kind of things, these cutaway drawings. Now you look at that, I think it's kind of cartoonish and it's fun. The cool thing about these drawings is they're incredibly accurate. You learn how something works, and the style of it is accessible and human. You learn, but it's accurate, right? It's not wrong in the way that he shows stuff. And that really taught me a lot about approachability and accessibility with data, which is something I think about a lot. And I, my kids, I've been forcing Rick to scurry down on my kids as well, and I feel they'll, they'll grab that too. Uh, partly, uh, you know, I thought about this, we did this range of um, uh, infographics books for kids. And when I did it, it was really kind of something I hadn't given too much thought about. It was, it was kind of a bit of fun, I thought it would be interesting to do. But my, for my kids, they really understood, started to understand what I did for a living, which, as anybody knows, explaining what you do to your children is tricky. And um, uh, uh, partly, I think, because when you're a kid, uh, the world's very kind of nuanced and grey. Things are often black and white, and numbers and data can give you a bit of certainty about the world and how we kind of understand it better. It's something that I think about a lot. So the subtitle really for this presentation could have been called What I Learned in the Newsroom. And a lot of the things that I learned uh, while I was at The Guardian really kind of carried through for me. So I, I joined in 1998, and uh, I was the launch editor for The Guardian website, which looks a little like that. Um, uh, I don't know why that happened. Uh, it used to look like that, very blocky. I actually kind of think there's a simplicity to, to it I really like. The blocks were called Brody blocks after the designer Neville Brody. Um, but I, I launched the site and I, went, I transferred over to the news desk of the paper on September the 10th, 2001. I don't know if that date might sound weird to people. Um, one of the things I found I was working on the desk and I was kind of collecting data a lot. Just for, because I was helping the graphics team, I was doing a lot of that work, I kind of fell into this work, I was just collecting data sets. And the first time you've looked for, I don't know, carbon emissions data or GDP data, it's kind of painful. So you keep it and you kind of build up this library. So we set up this thing called the Data Blog, the Guardian, which was the first newsroom um, kind of data website. We started off just re republishing data sets. We simplified and get them off PDFs, because PDFs are where data goes to die. And you know, the government still publishes tons of stuff in PDFs. Bad thing to do, so, and really kind of tried to make them accessible. This is uh, the Guardian newsroom around the time I was there, and that's me sitting in the corner of this, uh, this table's called the back bench, which is basically the, the, the kind of the editor, the main editor's tables, they were called the back bench. And um, I used to sit there with the graphics team, working with them to get graphics into the paper and kind of collecting data. So a number of things I learned from being in the newsroom, the, the most, first is kind of the most obvious, but actually kind of in the way it's the, it's something that we don't think about enough, especially when with companies, I think when we publish data, often it's about what's the marketing imperative, what's it gonna look like, and um, what we try and do really is think about how can we be data first in the projects that we do. So one of the projects we do, um, and I've got this book, Facts are Sacred, which you can find out there. Um, the world. This is one of the projects that we do, which um, I'm not going to put the audio, it's a bit distracting, but it's called Year in Search, and everybody sees Year in Search. Uh, it's, bit, it's probably Google's biggest kind of like data publishing project. Published at the end of every year is a video, there's like a website, an interactive and so on. And what it is really is a roundup of the year. And traditionally, these have been just like find a load of nice images, stick them in a video. And what we've insisted with this project is it's very much data-led. So all of the insights that you see on screen are things that we saw, saw that were trending this year. Everything is true to the data. It's a kind of principle now for year of search. And the result is you get something that's more human for people that they understand and they can relate to. 
in a way that if it's just some nice images, that oh yeah, and it kind of goes. But it feels real because the insights behind it are real. So that accuracy is really important. It carries across to lots of things that we do. So um, the next thing we'll talk about a little bit is about editing. And the reason we'll talk about editing is because I think a lot of the ways that people publish and use data is done without editing. It's really about kind of pushing the data out there. And the subtitle of this could really be why infographics done and I don't like dashboards. Mm -hmm. I'll explain what that is. So infographics, you've all seen things like this. Sometimes they go on for hours. You could you know, scroll, 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 scroll. And I think what people do is they just put all of the data they have on there because they can't choose which bits to put on there. So instead of remembering one thing, people remember nothing when they look at something like that. And I see this all the time. It's, it's upsetting to me if I know it because I think actually what, if you just get one lesson that people take away from the infograph, that's really important. And I think the same thing is sometimes true of dashboards, that people can't decide which data set's important, and so they throw it all on the dashboard. Now, that's not always the case, because sometimes you're in an industry where you actually know what all of these things mean, and you want to navigate between them, you want to kind of explore um, what those data sets are. So I think internally, they often work really well, just externally out in the world. You give people a dashboard, they don't know where to begin, they don't know where to start. What is the most important data set on here? They've all got exactly the same weight, Got these four things at the top, which are, which, I don't know which of those is most important. I can tell you. So instead of remembering at least one of these things, you remember nothing. There's an overuse of pie charts. Which, if you, anybody's read the work of Albert, Alberto Cairo, he will tell you pie charts never work if it's more than like three slices. And the reason is, I can't tell. I, I think that one's a bit smaller. Is that one smaller than that one? Probably not. Yeah, it is a little bit, but it's hard to tell. So I, I think dashboards can work sometimes. The, the, the exceptions are when we want to know everything. I think the Johns Hopkins COVID dashboard, which I'm sure everybody in this room has looked at at least once during the pandemic, is a good example of, it's kind of like a regular dashboard, but, but at that stage, we want to know all of this stuff. We want to know every single little bit of data and people are desperate for information. And it kind of worked really well. And even though other people were building stuff all the time, none of them were as successful in terms of kind of conveying information. And partly it worked because it was the first thing that people had, and then they had time to get used to it, so that by the time other stuff was published, there was already this out there, and people already understood how to use it. Um, we we worked a bit with COVID data as well. One of the things we did uh, was we funded this thing called the COVID Case Mapper, and the reason we did it was because part a lot of our work is working with newsrooms and trying to make data accessible. And one of the things we realised was that actually a lot of newsrooms, if you're a local reporter in Michigan, say, you just want to show Michigan. You don't really want to show the whole country. You might do, but you probably want to be able to focus in. Or maybe you're a reporter in that county and you want to just report on that county. So we gave basically created an interactive that could be embedded and shared at a very local level. We think a lot about sharing because if it's not shareable really in this day and age, it's not really going to spread or go viral, be useful to a lot of people. Um, and also, um, we think about the context of it, like if it is shared, what's going to be with it? And traditionally, what, what a lot of people do is they'll screenshot bits of interactions or visuals, and then they'll share those. So without any context or without anything, so we're trying to think, well, what can we provide around it? Um, and we find kind of global data in there as well. You can click into each of these countries and get like regional breakdowns which was something that really wasn't available anywhere else. So it was kind of like there was a hole there with a public data set. And even though you know, there's no actual Google data in here, but we felt by supporting that we're doing something useful for people. And, and that has a kind of like a, 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 a value there. We did the same thing with the census. Um, again, the census comes out every 10 years. What people want to know is what's changed. And that's what the, the, the census mapper does. You can zoom into to the county and tell you what's changed there as well. Um, so again, it's like taking data that's out there, maybe that data is like hard and difficult to use and trying to make it easier for people to, to use. Next thing to we'll talk about is timeliness. Uh, timeliness really is, is a tricky thing to get right because it kind of like there's an instinctual element to this. Like when, do, when are people going to care about something you do? You could do exactly the same thing a week apart and one week it will do incredibly well and the next week it won't. It's all about, it's all about timing. Um, sometimes, you know, that's because of the insights that you get out of like moments, like 
the, the spike in searches to move to Canada in 2016. Sometimes it's because people are caring about this thing at the moment. So this is a visual we did around uh, something we'd noticed about how people were searching for COVID right at the beginning. There was a kind of evolution in searches. And because people didn't, every country didn't have the same amount of cases at the same time, you could see these kind of things that would resonate at different times. So a lot of the first searches were kind of like, what is, what is, what is coronavirus? You know, that kind of thing. And then we started to see then all the symptoms. What, that switched to how to, how to searches, how to prepare for it, how to make hand sanitizer, how to make a face mask, you can all remember those days. Um, and that, and, and sort of seeing that stuff, but then thinking, well, what's the timing to get this out so that it'll have, it'll have an impact? We work a lot on kind of visuals like that. This was something we did around the German election, the search trends, the German election with a guy called Murat Stefana, who's probably like one of the world's leading infographics artists waves of interest. It's really showing a kind of a longer term picture of search interest across different issues in Germany ahead of their election. But it, it worked because of the timing of getting it out. And then related to that, of course, is, is relevancy. Whether it's seeing how kind of something like this, we're looking at these were issues searched across the US um, in, uh, uh, in every election cycle ahead of 2020 from 2004. And it was relevant in like October and early November 2020. Now it's less interesting. I mean, it's kind of academically interesting, but you know, it's less urgent than it would be if you're looking at September, October 2020. This is something we did um, where there really there's a few, couple things I want to talk about this whole project, really, about there's kind of lessons that we learned about the best way to do a visual project. One thing we realised off early on is that sometimes we would do things on our own and we'd publish them and they would, just wouldn't have any impact. Like they would be tweeted out or something by our account and that would be it. The best, kind of the highest impact we've had is when we worked with somebody else, which kind of like doubles our, our, our impact really. So, for instance, we work quite a lot with Axios. I don't know if anybody subscribes to Axios newsletters or so here, but Axios is a great news website. They specialise in what they call smart brevity which is essentially very, very short articles. They've also, the newsletter's incredibly influential, a lot of KOFs, opinion forms, so get access newsletters. It's quite a good way to get something out there into the world to partner with them. So we talked about what would be a good project to do, and I thought, well, why don't we look at what's happened to shopping trends since COVID, like during COVID and then that straight afterwards. So we started off with this project, this idea, and they called the new normal, what is the new normal for different things, and how certain, Certain things would kind of spike aggressively during COVID and then kind of drop off. Some things would spike and stay up, and some things would kind of revert to the revert to the mean. So we worked, we worked with Axios; they published it as well. So it's creating something that I guess is relevant. People care about it at that moment. The interact is cool; it's a good thing to do. But then it turns into something that kind of resonates beyond what we've done, and you know, it's, it's something that's about. Google and data, but not in a negative sense, it's about something interesting that we found out. Talk a little bit about accessibility. I mentioned Richard Scarry before, who's like a bit of a, something I return to a lot. I think a lot about making data accessible to people. And partly that's become a lot easier because just the tools we have available are way better than they used to be. So for instance, this is something that I made using a tool called Carto, which some of you might have used, like it's a great kind of mapping tool. It, they've kind of pivoted towards more business case stuff now. As when I went to Twitter, we're looking at people tweeting about the sunrise as the sun rose. So it's kind of something really simple. I would never have been able to make that myself without being a kind of an engineer like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And now the fact you can just do it you know, with a tool that's publicly accessible, accessible is, is really interesting to me. Um, we think a lot about this with trends. So this is the Google Trends site. Um, it will look a little bit different next year little preview. Um, but Google Trends is our kind of our bread and butter, it's what we work on most of the time. We manage the, the editorial content that lives on the site my team does, which includes these kind of curated pages. And Google Data is really interesting because it's obviously very big, right? Huge billion searches every day. The thing about trends is you can um, really get a sense of how people live. So this map is something I mean I use part of this as well actually, where I put basically every town where we had trends data um, is on the map. And then I took the map away. 
So there's actually, there's no map home. This is entirely based on, on, on searching. And so that's, and you can re-zoom and you can see how it reflects kind of like natural borders and natural kind of like geography and so on, which I find really fascinating to think. Um, and that data itself can be incredibly personal. So although it's, it's huge, it's a massive data set, it's something we have to work on, you may have to use all of the tools that we use to work on big data sets. The core of it is it's very, very human. It's about what we care about and what we think about. And all, I, feel, I feel like most data is like that, if not all data is like that, really. There's a humanity to it. We have to kind of remember when we're working with it. Um, and so we think about that a lot with the kind of projects that we work on. So for instance, this is something we did um, where uh, we worked with a designer to really think about how people search for translate, what they search for translate into English in different languages and how it changes. But it's done in a very kind of like fun way, it's human. My parents would love playing with this interactive, which is not true of all the work that I've worked on. Um, we also uh, work projects like this, where again we noticed there was a big spike in how to fix. And so what do you do when you search for how to fix? You go to Google to do it. So what are people searching for how to fix? And you can see in different countries. So for instance, uh, you can see this, the pink dotted line is the, um, the national average, the global average, sorry, for each thing. And the, the shape of it is the, the average in each country. So in the US, we search how to fix light bulb way more than the global average, uh, how to fix door way more than the global average, and, but, um, and faucet as well. And toilets, we search for how to fix toilets way more than people do globally. Whereas in France, they search for how to fix uh, washing machines and windows, but not light bulbs. And there's a lot of examples of this I think that are really interesting out there. It's the work of Mona Chalabi, whether you guys have heard of her. She's the data editor at The Guardian. And she is also an artist. You know, she draws stuff, but it's all based on data. So this, this project where um, what would happen for each endangered species, how many of them would fit into a, um, a, a New York um, subway car? And so this is uh, 60, 60 letters. Like, she's not just made up that number. Like, literally, she's done the data work to kind of calculate how many would actually fit into the car. So although they're hand-drawn, they don't look like a traditional data visualisation. They are a data visualisation. And it's accessible and understandable. So it kind of carries that, uh, that weight, which I think is really useful. And the work of Georgia Lupi and Stephanie Possebet is really, really interesting, I think, in this regard. There's a project they did called Dear Data, which is a lot of fun. It's a great book, great gift book to give somebody. But basically what they did for a year, they would send each other data visualizations about their lives. One was in um, London and one was in New York. And they would be hand-drawn kind of like data postcards, but they'd always be based on something real, a real life. And Georgia Lupi also did another project which I thought was quite moving. So she had a friend who had a blood condition and it was all about numbers of platelets and so on. So she started recording, and I kept the gods to keep like a visual diary of every day and her reading, so kind of personal medical readings, and turned that into this whole kind of beautiful project, which is based on that data. It's very human, real data, very personal data, but it turns itself into something kind of beautiful and accessible. This is something about me, that when I left The Guardian, the graphics team did a visualisation based on how difficult I was to work with. Um, but again, it's really personal. It's personal to me, and I think I think we can't often forget that that you know we think of data as kind of almost threatening and in a personal way. But actually, it's kind of it's interesting and fun in a personal way too. And most of that stuff is true. Although, when is it for? As soon as possible it is literally how I ask for things of designers. Um, and there are a lot of things like that you see out there. So it's the digital life index um, by uh, Publicis, which is a really beautiful project. It's around data that could be incredibly dry. It's essentially yeah, how we use how we use the internet. But they've done it in a very kind of accessible, interesting way that makes you want to click through and explore it and discover it. The contrast between something like that and say one of the dashboards we saw earlier, it's pretty high, right? It's like a different kind of experience. It's something that makes you want to explore it, entices you in, essentially. Um, this is another project um, done. This is about uh, black holes and how it works which I thought was fascinating. And again, it's kind of accessible. They're trying to make it personal to you. This project was by the Inclusive Wealth Building Alliance, which is not a group I know. But I thought it was interesting because it's about something like wealth disparity is a difficult thing to visualize in a way that might be interesting for people. 
but they've managed to do it in a way that's very local. You can see what's happening near you. You can see yourself in the data. And I've always noticed that, that the things, the projects that we do that work the best are ones that, where you can see yourself in the data, where you want to see yourself in the data, which is not always the case. So one of the things I think about a lot is about output and what the kind of the end product of something is going to be, which as somebody with a journalism background, output is not a word that we use a lot. When I was, um, when I was at The Guardian, uh, one of the graphic designers got to, to put this together for me because I was kind of sketching out how I get to a data project and where, where does it begin and where does it end and so on. And I think a lot about that process. So for me, this is what we think about every day. We think about, we have data set, we've got trends. We think that there are recurring events. Maybe we've got a theory or something that's come up, like, you know, during COVID, everybody's searching for how to cut their own hair, for instance. So we start looking into that. Um, or, or during this midterm, how much people are searching for inflation, for instance, which we know is a massive issue. And then, um, often a lot of the work we do is statistically incredibly simple. Now, that's, that's not, not getting the data. Getting the data can be hard, but the work we the analysis we do is often like things like, is it bigger than something else? How has it changed over time? And part of the reason we do that is because that's easier for people to understand, honestly, that kind of, that kind of analysis. But also, just that still gives you a ton of flexibility. And we think a lot also about what are the data sets you can use with it. It's, it's often, data will often be, um, more powerful once you mash it up with something else. And then, you know, we have to deal with a lot of this stuff, the, cold, the, the crappy, kind of boring uh, middle bit of data work. And at the end of it is this, is this word output, which, you know, is not really a term that you think of in terms of creative word, you know, the output, but that's kind of what it is. And that output could be an interactive visual, it could be something we just publish on social media, like just publish a number on its own, a percentage increase or drop could be interesting or it might be a story or a video. And, and that flexibility is what makes it feel so interesting to, to work in. And that's why we work a lot with these guys. So these are people like Alberto Caro, Nadia Bremer, George Lupi, who are just fantastic visual designers. And what we do is we say to them, we've got a budget, we want to produce a visual. We don't just want to produce another kind of marketing visual. What we want is, is to have some kind of impact on them. We want people to want to look at it. And, and they can do what they want. We give them the heads, we give them the data, and the, the only things we have is that the data's downloadable and accessible, and the, the, the code for what they do is accessible too, so people can then replicate it. We want people to replicate the work we do. Um, we see some of the, the, the fruits of this project. This is uh, one that Moritz Stefano did for us. We were looking at searches around food over time, and so what he really had to do was to find a way to cram a ton of line charts into a single chart. How would that work? So the idea was it would be like search interest, um, food, you've got the, the, the amount of interest is the dark colours and then it stretches out towards the, the, to go to the months. And uh, we'll have the side effect, which it wasn't, we didn't know until we did the data, that some of the charts end up looking like food, which is weird. So you've got the donut, uh, the pear there, the onion, eggplant's not bad, but the filter fish is the best one, plainly. Um, and it's a cool visual, right? because it's about something we care about. We all, we all care about food. It's trying to kind of visualise it in an innovative way that's a bit different. So it's kind of there's something kind of curious about it, but it's curious enough to pull you in. And it's, um, and it's fun. The other thing I think a lot about is about transparency. And what I mean by that is traditionally what we do is, right, and everybody does this, we have data and we try and keep it to ourselves. And one of the kind of unique things, I guess, about Google Trends is it's this massive data set that's publicly available. That's something that anybody can download. And that public availability hasn't, has, has not been a bad thing for Google. It's only been a good thing because it encourages people to think this is data that's useful to them that they can, they can reuse. So we actually publish data sets um, on, on GitHub, ironically. Um, perhaps, but we publish data sets. We put, every day you'll go on there, you'll find new kind of data sets, the things we've worked on that people can download and use. And people do download them, and they use them, they create new visuals with the Google data, which we see out there in the world. So it creates, again, this bit of this hopefully virtuous circle of putting data out there, people using it, and then, and then, uh, and then it comes back to help us. The other thing to think a lot about is how can we be innovative with the data? I'm gonna show you a couple of projects here. Um, so one of the things, I guess, I've always thought a lot about innovation. This is a 
This is a newsroom. This is actually from Hold the Front Page, which is, yeah, I turned to His Girl Friday, the best film about journalism ever. And we should watch it. Fantastic. But um, journalism has always been about innovation. The Telegraph was really kind of expanded news by newsrooms ahead of all other kind of businesses. And journalists are always thinking about how to innovate. And we try and, um, we try and kind of use that a lot. So, for instance, this is something New York Times did last year. Was, I love this project, partly because we were having wildfires, so I was thinking about air quality a lot. It's really about air quality. And what they'd done was they had turned the data, the air quality data, for different cities into um, to dots. So you could see, you could look on your phone, you could see what it would look like, and you could compare different cities. So this is New Delhi, um, this, during the north, air crisis in northern, northern India, and you could see the kind of how what we were going through would compare to them. I'm going to share that again, actually, because that's kind of cool. But again, it's like it's on your phone, it's accessible, but it's using something new and innovative. And people have thought a lot about how do we use AR for visualizations? How do we do it? And the Times is pretty well set up to do that, and that's what it did. This is another project we did where we were looking at, this was during Brexit, we were looking at how people search for Brexit in different places and thought, well, this is kind of cool. It's also, it's almost kind of 3 d What if we turned it into a VR visual? What would it work, look like? So we had a two week sprint and we turned it into a VR database where basically you can look around and you'd see each country and you'd see the top questions. Which visual, we learned some stuff about virtual reality and database, one of which is you had to give people a floor, otherwise they feel physically sick. It is possible to make people physically sick with data visualizations. Um, but it's cool, it's like an experiment. Also, you can't get as much information in a VR visual as you can in a regular visual, even on a phone. It's because people can't, it's too much. You can't, you can't, people can't deal with it. Thought a lot about how to do it they are. We did this experiment as well, um, where we kind of allowed people to create kind of AR visualizations of their of things they were they were interested in or topics or themes, and then you could see the kind of trends data around them. This is a project we did. Sometimes we work almost as visual consultants for partners. So it's a project we did at the Washington Post, where they wanted to show YouTube live videos that happened after the protests after the murder of George Floyd and see how you could kind of categorise them. They hadn't really thought about how to get hundreds of videos in a way that you can navigate between them. So we worked to kind of think of a way you could do that in a kind of visually interesting way. And um, this was shortlisted for an Emmy, which was cool. Didn't win, but shortlisted is good. And um, I think it tells that story in ways that are really interesting. It uses uses those videos in fascinating, fascinating ways. Um, this is another project I'm going to talk about really quickly. So we've thought a lot about um, how we could um, visualize, turn visualizations into sound. Partly because data is something that you know is not accessible to everybody. What if you were visually impaired? How would you understand data? So we built a tool called Two Tone. It's like it's another experimental kind of hack, and you can load data sets in there. Time series works best, and turn it into essentially music. You turn different notes into different things. So I'm going to play this data set, which I think is, uh, is uh, the census population. It's something I, we use it for, if anybody listens to our podcast, we use uh, a different data set for different piece of music each, um, each day. So this is uh, what this sounds like. It's like, it's a new way to do it. It doesn't necessarily, we work, still work on how can you make that data understandable for people, but the fact you can turn data into something new. Maybe it's enticing for people, maybe it's interesting, or maybe it's helpful. There's actually, this is, has formed now the basis of a project with local governments where they're looking at trying to make their data sets more accessible and sonify them, essentially, so that they can be understood in lots of different ways. So, okay. Um, but once we're getting more technology advanced, in some ways we get less technology advanced as well. One of the, 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 the changes in the way that we consume data really is the, this growth of mobile, the fact that you know, the number of people who are going to look at a visualisation on a laptop, on a big screen, is shrinking. And the number of people who are going to look at it on a phone is really growing. 
So one of the side effects of that has been the growth of data GIFs. Really taking GIFs is like one of the oldest you know, forms of, of visualising around anything. And the amount of the popularity of creating these visuals, which are really just like very shareable, a super simple image, essentially, that's, that's still hard to produce. And we've really seen that grow and how you can actually do quite sophisticated things with some of the technology that's pretty old. And so it's not necessarily always about using the newest thing. Sometimes it's about using what's already there in, um, in more interesting ways. And this is a project. Um, you can actually, if you Google data gift maker, you can find it. It's a way to make your own gifts um, as well. We made that available. You can make your own gifts and download them with data. So talk a little bit about simplicity. I'm going to talk about this guy. This is, I talk about stories a lot. This is Biscuit. He was our, uh, uh, we got him, he's not a COVID puppy, but we did get him like six months before COVID. And um, having never had a dog before, it's kind of interesting to us. Like, why do dogs do the things they do and, and the way that people search dogs? So these are searched for cats versus dogs globally over a year. And, so, and red is uh, people's, uh, where dogs are more searched and blue is where cats are more searched which I find really interesting. I'm not a cat person, I'm sorry. Um, but the, the way that dogs do something and well, the, re the way that pets, cats or, do, or pets or any kind do something is really interesting people and they search a lot around that. So we thought well, this would be a kind of interesting project. So it's something that started off where I was wondering why my dog does the weird things that he does and he does many weird things. And, and turning that into something that's actually kind of relevant, like why do cats do that? And yeah. Why do the dogs shiver and um, why do they eat grass? So this was a project we did with Nadia Bremer where the data itself was, was pretty complicated. Really what we were doing was we were looking at every single um, search around why do dogs do X and why do cats do Y. And then so that, that was then turned into a visual which is actually really easy to use. It's beautiful, it looks hand-drawn even though that's, that's just a fiction obviously. It's accessible, people want to play with it, and it uh, tells you something, and it's like, it's a nice kind of story to tell, but it's also doing something complicated at the back end. You're not inflicting that complications, those complications on your user. You're just using them in a way to make that story more accessible. So really, I guess, if I just summarise what I say, what this talk is about is really about telling that story but in the best way possible, and the, the, re the, the way that we have tools to do that is something that's that's incredibly empowering and powerful, but it also gives you a responsibility. You're not just throwing data at screen, but you're really thinking about how you do that. <laughs>